What's up, guys? Welcome back to another edition of Before the Whistle presented by BRK Insurance Group. If your business is looking for the best in employee benefits, commercial property and casualty insurance, or retirement and 401k plan services, there's no one better to meet your challenges and build a plan centered around your needs than BRK Insurance Group. Yeah, we're doing that again. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another edition of Before the Whistle presented by BRK Insurance Group. If your business is looking for the best in employee benefits, commercial property and casualty insurance, or retirement and 401k plan services, there's no one better suited to meet your challenges and build a plan centered around your needs than BRK Insurance Group. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another Friday edition of the show coming off the heels of what was a historic signing day for Tulane looking forward into this 2024 season where I don't really understand what signing day is anymore or when the official one is for that matter. But this was kind of the time where we finally all got together. Head coach John Summerall came and met with the media at fair length to discuss what was, again, a historic recruiting class for Tulane, both overall in the transfer portal and in high school. And so kind of breaking down what that recruiting class was like and just my takeaways from that press conference, because I think that was really the first time where you have the introductory press conference with John Summerall, and we all had such great takeaways from that. And we've seen all of the moves now that he's made both with the coaching staff and with the players and all these marquee names that he's brought in. But this was really the first time, even though I saw him in Mobile, that really felt like the first time I saw him as Tulane's coach in that capacity. Uh, but this was the first time that it really felt like we were witnessing what was going on with this new changing of the hand and that he was speaking to us as a sitting head coach of Tulane and not the guy coming in as the, the first day of his job and having work to already go over. And just the length at which he spoke with the media, the amount of insight that we gained, not only just on the evaluation of players, but I think just a sense of the, the culture and vision here over at Tulane, both on the field and off the field and what it really says about Tulane's future. And that's what I'm really going to focus on in today's show is just looking a little bit at that class on its face, diving into that with plenty of time in the future. And then just again, what these names and what this interaction and and I and feeling along John Summerall really feels different and like the, the future for Tulane is in these really awesome hands. And then I want to just wrap it up with yesterday being women in sports day and just you know, I, I've been sitting here these last couple of days just thinking about, again, how grateful I am to be a woman in this industry that has the insight and the ability to absorb all of this information that I do. But just, again, recognizing that it, it's still a battle for women in this sport, and I'm always going to talk about these things when it feels like it's appropriate and the offseason seems like that. So we'll just wrap that up with a little Taylor Swift talk, if you will, on today's Friday show. All right, y'all, Rome is not built in a day. And as such, my breakdown of this recruiting class is not all going to be in one episode. I mean, I just feel like I would like to take the time to really break down the amount of recruits that Tulane has coming over. I mean, it just struck me the amount of guys coming over and then looking at the quality on top of that. But even just running into Rob Green and JJ McCleskey after the press conference, two coaches from the previous coaching staff that are remaining on, talking about the amount of DBs they have to play with, essentially. I mean, it's a really exciting thing to have just this many names to be able to go over. And so trying to do all that in one episode without really knowing that much about these guys would feel like a little bit of a disservice. So I just kind of want to talk about the quality, again, of these recruits and what that really spells for Tulane's future. Um, and I'm basing this off of the 24-7 sports ranking system um you know there's a lot of different ones out there each one has their algorithms but when you look at Tulane's recruiting class not only does it stack up pretty well in the rest of the league uh, their overall class is first in the AAC um they break it up as recruiting and transfers and if you look at the recruits I believe Tulane is second to USF I want to say but they brought in so many quality transfers and to me those are the pieces that are going to matter the most in the immediate impact. I think that, again, you bring in a lot of guys that redshirt and you have that size and you plug them in if you're able to use them. But we've seen Tulane utilize the portal in a really good way these last couple of years. And yes, it was under a previous coaching staff, but it really speaks to me just the fit of John Summerall with Tulane, how quickly he came to understand the assignment here of 
the value of a Tulane degree, degree and the opportunity to be in the college football playoffs on that national stage, it, it's a rare opportunity that has now presented itself to Tulane, where if they weren't in the position of success that they had had these last couple of seasons, which is something that he acknowledged in his uh, press conference, well, then we probably wouldn't be seeing this quality recruit and the idea of the college football playoffs wouldn't really include Tulane in the conversation. But the fact that they were the G5 representative a season prior and won their game against the Heisman Trophy winner in the Cotton Bowl and then went on to sustain that success. And I've been thinking a lot about Tulane's team last year, and I think there's a lot of fair criticisms, particularly looking at the offensive production, that would be relevant to talk about if any of that was still around. But it's an entirely different coaching staff. It's an entirely different offense. There's going to be a different quarterback. Really, the the most um, familiar, I was trying to say reassuring, but that wasn't the correct word, familiar thing on Tulane's offense is going to be Makai Hughes. But I don't think that he's going to be necessarily relied on as much as he was before. But if Tulane doesn't pull that off, doesn't go back to the conference championship, yes, they ended up losing in that game. And then their bowl game, military bowl didn't go well. But all of that is within the context of everything going on behind the scenes. The fact of the matter is, particularly with SMU leaving the G5 conversation and Liberty not doing very well in their bowl game and just all of the attention and the momentum that is being put towards Tulane, that, that's a real thing. It's an unignorable thing. I say it all the time on the sideline, how important things like momentum are to a team. And it matters in the offseason. It matters when people are looking at preseason rankings and looking at that G5 program to watch. Tulane can put itself at the top of that conversation. And I think that's really what you're seeing in these recruits, where Tulane had 32 total recruits. 16 of those were high school. The other 16 come from the transfer portal, although three of those are JUCO transfers. So I'm not entirely sure how that's broken down. But when you look at the amount of three-star recruits that Tulane has um, and the amount of four-stars, they were one of just a few other schools. USF had one four-star recruit. Memphis had one four-star and UTSA had one as well. Tulane had two. And I have to admit, I don't really understand how this system takes things into account. I guess it doesn't take the rankings of the transfer guys into that, even though it, it says the 32 overall number, because I mean, just looking at the amount of transfer recruits that they have on here, um, they have several four-star guys. They have two four-star signees from their high school recruiting class. One of those is Jaden Lewis, a defensive back from Alabama. And he was previously committed to Auburn and they were able to flip him and he was someone that John Summerall spoke on his traits already. He's been on campus that he has great speed. His athleticism has really shown great change of direction and they could see him being an elite cover guy. He just has to get the football IQ down and make that transition. And that'll speak to however fast he'll be able to develop. And he is the other four star alongside Dominic Stewart, who is an O lineman from Georgia that had previously um no, I'm sorry. That was another guy. See, there's literally so many that I'm getting this worked up. Um, one of the signees the day of was another O lineman that was previously committed under Willie Fritz. Uh, and he had kind of decommitted amidst the coaching change. His name is Reese Baker from Alabama. And John Summerall pointed to jo uh, Dan Roshar having a relationship that was so great that it was able to really bring them through that process. But the four-star guy was not the flip of the, the day of. Um, it's Dominic Stewart again. And he was someone that, it's been very fascinating to just kind of hear about John Summerall's coaching journey. And you just forget that you really have elite pedigree guys in this building. When I ran into him at the senior bowl, was talking to him about, you know, he was here to see, I, I saw him when he was seeing Jaquan Jackson and Michael Pratt, but I, you know, just for conversation was talking about the Troy guys that they had there. They had two, uh, an edge rusher and a running back. And then he pointed to the fact that a guy he had uh, recruited while he was at Kentucky on their staff was there at the senior bowl as well. So he had a lot of representation there, but John Summerall has ties in the SEC and that has really already shown that it matters just in the quality of these guys. But the story he told about Dominic Stewart was very fascinating to me where he actually has been recruiting him, trying to recruit him over to Troy for a very long time. Uh, he had seen him last summer at an SEC camp. He wasn't there, but a lot of the staff that knew John Summerall knew they were probably not going to pick up this guy, but were sending him videos saying this is a guy that you probably want to look at. And I guess he had committed somewhere and 
reopened his commitment process because he put on a bunch of weight during this last year and SEC schools started to call him. So obviously you're going to pick up the phone. What I really like about John Summerall and just the vibes of this whole coaching staff and their identity is their willingness to just go full send, go to that for that top guy and, and shoot and, and see what happens. And that to me is exactly what he did in this instance. And the relationships you build with families matter. The impressions that you leave on these guys, it just matters so much. And this was a perfect example where he pointed to grandma, Miss Helen, which was cool for me because I have a Miss Helen that I'm close to in my life. Um, she really liked the idea and the fit of Tulane. And he said that she recruited John Summerall and Tulane just as much as he was trying to recruit over Dominic Stewart and just pointing again to the great academics, the great city and the great fit. And those are the words that he kept using to describe these guys and speaking to the local ties about this. And the other cool thing about Dominic Stewart was he said he's going to probably have him in as a jumbo tight end and perhaps an eligible receiver. And when he was going through the wide receiver room, he was talking about running 10 and 11 personnel because of the amount and the diversity and just speed and talent in that wide receiver room. It's all very exciting. And I love things like jumbo packages where you have an eligible lineman um, justice for the Detroit Lions still, but it, it just stuck out to me in that same conversation about Dominic Stewart that he kept pointing to city culture fit and that they were flipping guys that were committed to places like Auburn, like Colorado, which is where he referred to him as, I think it was ZJ Lewis. Um, it says Zycar Lewis Jr. I'm assuming that that's his, um, the way that he just goes um, ZJ but he was a wide receiver. He was a flip the day of, and he came over from Colorado. And so to be able to get these guys that are committed to these big 12 programs, these SEC programs, come over for a new coaching staff and a new regime, that says a ton to me. But the other thing I wanted to point out too is, even though I am a little confused about this ranking system, because just looking at, and I'm just going to pull up the page, I mean, by their definition, a uh, five-star is 98 and above rankings. And- they refer to Ty Thompson both, um, they refer to him in high school as a, a four-star recruit with a 98.09 recruiting rank. And that's just obviously not correct. And so I don't really understand that. And I'm just pulling this up to make sure that I have it entirely correct. Um, Ty Thompson. Yeah, they have him as a four-star with the 98 composite ranking. And, and just again, by their definition, that should be a, a five-star as should Mario Williams, who was a 98 recruit out of high school, but that's just like, it's not that important, but I found it interesting that they kind of broke down their three-star system. Uh, I've talked about the fact that I am doing the scouting Academy. I completed the defensive back position group, and now I'm working on defensive line, but because I've had to take so much time off, I've really been reorienting myself with all of just the materials for writing a report and grading these players before I just jump back into my film study. And so I was just looking at the grading system that they made for us. And it's a one to seven scale and it's not a composite ranking like they do for these things. I mean, cause we're, they're actually trying to train you to be NFL scouts and scout each trait, grade each trait, and then write your own projection of the player. So it's, it's a challenging thing. And it's the psychology behind having a five, uh, number grading scale and the fact that most people are inclined to just pick the middle categories. And so you're not really going to see any ones or any fives. You're just going to see a ton of threes and probably too many twos, too many fours. It just forces people to go towards the middle. And so by making us use a seven point grading scale, they still kind of expect. And I just think that's interesting that there's almost this built in psychological bias that they have there where they kind of expect us to still employ that five grade scale. And thinking back, I definitely didn't give a seven to any of the defensive backs. The point is that they don't give us those elite players. So you really have to dig deep, but I, I might've given one, one grade on one trait, but it is really hard to do that. And they just kind of drop off from two star to no stars. And so it, it's two, three, four, five, but they kind of break up there are three star rankings in a way that reminds me of the scouting academy, where it's something like you know poor, marginal, adequate, solid, good, great, elite. And when we're writing our can and cannot sections, only goods and above, or I'm sorry, fours and above, which is solid, um, are in the can section. Anything considered adequate or lower is in the cannot. All that to say, you know. 
as uh, we talk about analytics and discourse and I, something that really is just not get um, the due discourse that it really deserves in terms of what that stuff really is. But when I think about numbers and just things like that, that's where this stuff really fascinates me, where we're all just talking about three, four, five, six, but teams and um, the NFL each have to have a grading system. Some of them are, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, it doesn't matter, but there always has to be this kind of centralized going back to that information. But even though it's a seven point grading system, three of those are in one section and four of those are in another and four of those being you know, positive traits and then three of those denoting negative traits. So even though it's still a cannot, it still matters if a guy is a one at those traits versus a three, because you might be able to develop him if he has good traits in other areas, for example, um, and then, you know, has a adequate grade in mental processing where that, that actually wouldn't really work out. It's usually they have a stronger mental processing grade in a lower athletic category, but you know, if they seem to have really good ball skills, for example, or they don't have very good run support, but you grade them really well in range. I talked about this on my last episode. That's where you look at where you can place guys. And to bring this back to this conversation here, I just wanted to point out that despite Tulane only having two noted four-star re recruits within this system, they break it up into high three-star, mid three-star, low three-star. And it is kind of that same verbiage that you look at when you're projecting these guys from the scouting academy, where a low three-star would be someone that would be a probable starter at a group of five. They would be able to make an impact because you have to say whether or not they're an impact player, whether or not you can win with them, if they're not going to do anything, or if you're going to win in spite of them, all this kind of uh, terminology. And they would require, they would kind of consider that a potential contributor at a power five program. A mid three star, and I'm just reading off of this, would be a capable starter at a power five school and an impact player at the group of five level, which means that, you know, they're an obvious starter, but we're getting away from the impact potential. They would be an impact player at the group of five and a capable starter on a power five team, as much as that may or may not matter nowadays, but we're still in the system that we might must work with. And then High three star gets rid of power five and G five, and it considers it to be a player with significant NFL upside. And they expect to be an impact college football player. So we've gotten rid of the power five G five moniker and looking at mid three stars. That's really not even bad either, because again, Tulane to get to the dance is still in the group of five and is majority around group of five competition. And worse, these are just, they're not, you know, for sure rankings here, but just counting this, um, they had one, two, they had four guys that are considered high three-star recruits. And I would just kind of throw them in with the same as a, a four-star, because we're talking about a guy that's graded at an 88 versus a 90. I know that those do make a huge difference, but to have that many guys on the high scale and then six guys in that mid-range, or I'm sorry, that's six guys with just an 86 grade in that mid-range, then you have six or seven more uh, to make things easier out of all 16 high school recruits, they had one low grade three star and one two star who, you know, out of 78 on this scale. Other than that, they have an entire recruiting class full of impact players. And that's not even getting into the transfer portal where you really saw Tulane go for these marquee names. And I think, again, when I was talking in my intro about John Sumrall and his impact and his vision for this program, it really all requires every working part to be in concert now. I do feel like when, you know, Willie Fritz left the program, it was definitely a reckoning moment for Tulane in, you know, do we really want to make a go at this or do we want to kind of sit back and recollect ourselves and potentially look to move conferences? And it's been very fascinating to me as this off season has gone along where when I believe it was David Harris's introductory press conference as Tulane's athletic director he had kind of said something about being okay with where we're at right now. It's not exactly where he, what he said, but people kind of jumped on that as to why is the Tulane not looking to immediately jump out of the group of five. I mean, good luck to SMU um, trying to make it to the college football playoffs next year, jumping conferences like that. And, you know, good luck to Houston, Cincinnati, and UCF trying to climb the ladder in a conference that just keeps adding more and more teams to it. Tulane just has to be the top rated group of five team. So that's a completely different conversation. 
but you have to be able to back that up when you say it. Because the worst thing to do would be to go out there and sound like a snake oil salesman and be promising people up the river when you know you can't deliver on things. And it was very striking walking around the Wilson Center yesterday that it looks like there is a lot of construction being done. I know they've posted a few things on Twitter very cryptically, but you have to think that if it's the Wilson Center, we're going to be seeing potentially, you know, operations for two, uh, for them. And we've heard about the indoor practice facility. I think those things are very important, but equally important is the guys that are going to be fielding this team next year. And that I, I think demand the necessity of a lot of these facilities because Tulane is just not getting these guys in the building before for one reason or another. And you really have to credit Willie Fritz as well for the way that he left this program and John Summerall really acknowledged that, I believe, you know, coming in and not just Willie Fritz, but the players and Michael Pratt. Michael Pratt probably changed Tulane's history in a way that is not entirely appreciated and understood yet. And we really got a good glimpse of that when he was talking to us about the process of getting Ty Thompson, where for the first time in his career, it wasn't him having to reach out to players, but he straight up said that guys were calling him with interest that wouldn't have answered the phone that he would have thought calling them in the past. And the fact that his absence, Michael Pratt, you know, will he or won't he kind of come back? It does kind of get people buzzing. And so that's where I think the interest really drummed up. And we were able to have choice at quarterback. And I say we, but I, you know, Tulane, um, that is really important to me. And that's where John Summerall started talking about NIL as well, where he straight up said we are in an adapt or die time and reading between the lines here when he uses the term marquee names we don't have to get into the weeds of what exactly the nil is being dealt out but we know how good of a collective fear the wave has been and continues to be and how much the community support has made a massive difference in being able to make a run at the college football playoffs to be honest but also john summerall really acknowledging that if that's the second question that comes out of a player's mouth and they're on campus pretty much bye um Again, it's acknowledging that it is an important and necessary aspect of college football now, but he is a football guy um, and he just wants to talk football with these guys. And if the second question is talking about money, then you're not really sure if they're really there for the football or not. And what stuck out when he was talking about Ty Thompson was he was the best fit for the program. And that took into account fit with the city, fit with his culture, fit with the team and the fact that Ty Thompson never brought up NIL at all in their conversation. Um, and I really liked just again, how much of a look behind the curtain we're really getting with John Summerall with him explaining that, you know, he called uh, Tez Johnson, who is Bo Nix's adoptive brother. When uh, he was recruiting Ty Thompson, they FaceTimed the two of them because he wanted to see how Ty Thompson interacted with his teammates and with those guys and be able to see that for himself. And then the Oregon coaching staff really spoke to how high of a character that he had. And that was before he started getting into how talented of an arm he has. The fact that he's been winning all of his position group workouts where, you know, he kind of explained it where you have the line guys, then you have the mid guys, which is everything outside of pretty much skill positions. So, you know, quarterbacks, running backs, that kind of thing, tight ends, those are all in that same group. And he's been winning all of these workouts. And I mean, he also just has great size, 6'4", 224, and was rated as a 98.09 coming out of high school. He was higher rated than Mario Williams, but he has options to throw to now. Um, Mario Williams, and the way that he really went into the fact that, you know, Mario Williams is a guy that has just great short area of quickness and, and juice, and just you can enter a different dimension in this offense with him. Um, pointing out Therese Trainer, a transfer from Idaho, as being that kind of bigger X player who can work on the boundary and reminded him a lot of a Troy player uh, pointing to Shaz Preston from Alabama, who uh, again was another, what would be a very, very high four-star recruit with a 97.68 ranking out of high school um, saying that he is kind of more of that combo flex guy that can do a little more diverse things all over the place. And same with uh, Jalen Griffin from UCF, although he does have the size to play X, you can also use him on the field. And that's when he started kind of getting into how, you know, the, the 10 and 11 personnel and just what toys Tulane really has to work with next year. I mean, Tulane is really coming out of this whole thing stronger than ever. And you just feel like 
all of the culture and all of the talk and, and, you know, all the work that coach Fritz and the players, you know, the guys like Nick Anderson, Dorian Williams, Tajay Spears, Michael Pratt, the legacy that they really wanted to leave. This to me is really what you're seeing more than anything else, where it's an attractive position for a coach that people say should be in the sec in the next year or two. And for him to be able to bring over, have that control over the coaching staff, I'm really looking forward to meeting um, Rusty Witt, their new strength and conditioning guy. Another great story he told about him where he initially wasn't going to retain him because he had brought, he had a guy that he was going to bring in for strength and conditioning. When he took the Troy job, he met with all the team leaders, asked them what two things had to change after winning five games a year prior and what two things had to stay the same. And everyone pointed to Rusty Witt. And then they sat down and he was like, you know, we're really more alike than ever. It reminded me a lot of, the story of the captains after the two and 10 year, Nick, Dorian, Michael Pratt, Sincere Hainsworth sitting down, making a list of things out that were in their control and things that had to change and things that, you know, were out of their control or things that they wanted to build on in order to get through to next season. And for a first time head coach, it was so impressive to me about the leadership of those captains, but it, it's equally impressive to me to have that type of presence of mind as a first time head coach to get the feedback of the guys that know better than you do at that point. Um, and that's really, again, the smartest people know that they're not the smartest in the room at all times and all facets. And being able to trust the players and the culture that they've been working towards and listen to them in that aspect, that to me is huge. And so I'm just, it's something I'm really looking forward to. I, I mean, he was a Green Beret in the Iraq war. Um, that can't be understated. Just there, there's no substitute in life. Um, there's any nothing that's comparable to that. Um, but you know, that's very, you know, unconventional warfare combat type tactics where that that gets pretty ferocious. And I, I've been reading up on him, seeing that, you know, he has the players wear gas masks and it's just this very chaotic type of workout. I think there was a huge emotional void and a physical void left behind with Kurt Hester going on to Houston. You just hear how all the players talked about him that sincere Hainsworth wanted to come back for another year to train with him that you no know, he was who Nick Anderson trusted to get through the draft process he ran pro day for them last year and that to me was a very underrated shoes to fill thing well I really think that again it's just a knock out of the park higher but it speaks again to just the character of John Summerall and his willingness to listen and then you've seen you know, I, I think that same kind of thing shore out here where he has retained several of the guys from the previous coaching staff and valued them and spoke of them. And a lot of them having a, a big part in getting them through that really tough process. He also shouted out Slade Nagel and that in the transition and keeping this recruiting class from bursting at the seams. You know, he's talking about the fact that he was FaceTiming guys over at Tulane that were here on visits because he was still wrapping things up over at Troy. And when you have no sitting head coach, and you have uh, you know that the interim isn't going to be the head coach in that aspect, it makes it very difficult to try to recruit and retain. And not only did he recruit, he also retained. I mean, you look at, again, Kai Horton coming back, Alex Bauman coming back, those guys that entered the transfer portal that decided to come back for another year. And I'm going to be really looking forward to covering who starts at quarterback. I mean, he shouted out Darian Mensa, Kai Horton, and Ty Thompson. And if I learned anything from last year, and the running back competition, it's that naming someone outright does no one any good. So I'm just really looking forward to spring camp. I'm looking forward to diving into these guys as these kind of weeks go on. But just the presence that John Summerall had, you know, Steve Barrios, the color analyst, was there alongside me. We were just talking about how impressive it really was to watch how he spoke to us. The fact that they're really digging their teeth into the sand here locally, where every coach on the staff has four to eight local schools that they're assigned to, to build those relationships, cultivate that. That's really huge that, you know, 25% of the recruiting class was from Louisiana. And that was without doing any of this work yet that we've seen them start to put into place. And when you just look at the caliber of these high and mid three-star prospects, and that really being the difference maker, I think here, looking at what that terminology means, seeing that you have so many impact players coming in at the, um, high school level. And then the fact that you have what should be two former five-star transfers, um, one current in Mario Williams, Shaz Preston was also a four-star out of high school, but then you have several guys that were ranked in that high and mid category as well. And yes, your rankings, every, I have yet to see one go up when they've transferred, 
Um, and I think it, it takes into account where they transferred from, how they did, but you just never know. You never know what the fit was like there. You never know what the vision was like. You never know really any of that. And so just as much as you don't, there's not a ton to go off of, off of the high school rankings. I'm really not inclined to pay that much attention to the, the slight change in the transfer portal. The fact of the matter is these are marquee names, like it or leave it. These are guys that are transferring over from Oregon, from USC, Alabama, Kentucky, UCF. And then all of the guys coming over from Troy, you know, is specifically pointed to Deshaun Baptiste on that D-line. Noting that there are some holes that I really want to dive into on some of these coming episodes, but those are guys that he knows through and through. And so you just know that those are quality guys coming over for Tulane. And despite probably the most turnover in the 21st century for Tulane, uh, it hasn't really seemed to matter. In fact, it's really only seemed to go up from here. And that speaks to the legacy that I've really watched be built over these last few years and also speaks to that work done by the players to make sure that they didn't leave Tulane going from that two and 10 year. They left it better than they found it. And now I'm looking forward to seeing how this new coaching staff really reaps those benefits. It's easy to hear a promo in the middle of a podcast and think, of course they like the product they're paid to. Well, if you know me at all, then you know, two things. One, I'm truthful almost to a fault. And two, if I were in it for the money, well, I would certainly be doing something else. So believe me when I say that I love Blue Oak Barbecue. The food, the drinks, the people, the location, yes, all of it. Blue Oak Barbecue has a great selection of your favorites from the smoker, fantastic sides, and as I always continue to attest to, awesome bar specials, including one this week. So go check them out. Blue Oak Barbecue, 900 North Carrollton Avenue here in New Orleans, or visit them online at blueoakbarbecue.com. Speaking of that awesome bar special, again, happy Mardi Gras, y'all, as we continue to go through these next couple weeks of the Mardi Gras season here in New Orleans. No better special for Blue Oak Barbecue than their king cake daiquiri. And they have an extra shot option this year where for just $5, you can add a shot of white chocolate strawberry, apple pie, or banana cream moonshine. You might be thinking those might sound a little insane with a king cake daiquiri. MJ Lloyd at Blue Oak Barbecue is a mixologist for you, and I recommend that y'all go over and get yourself one. It's easy to hear a promo in the middle of a podcast and think, of course they like the product, they're paid to. Well, if you know me... It's easy to hear a promo in the middle of a podcast and think, of course they like the product, they're paid to. Well, if you know me at all, then you know two things. One, I'm truthful, almost to a fault. And two, if I were in it for the money, I'd certainly be doing something else. So believe me when I say that I love Blue Oak Barbecue. The food, the drinks, the people, the location, yes, all of that. Blue Oak Barbecue has a great selection of your favorites from the smoker, fantastic sides, and awesome bar specials every week, and one that I'm gonna break down right now. Go check them out, Blue Oak Barbecue, 900 North Carrollton Avenue here in New Orleans, or visit them online at blueoakbbq.com. And again, y'all, as we are rolling through Mardi Gras here in New Orleans, no better time to have drink specials over here at Blue Oak Barbecue and MJ Lloyd, uh, the bartender, the mixologist, the creator of all of this beautiful madness at Blue Oak, really understood the assignment. So these are all um, drinks on the go coming with a uh, travel pouch. So we're going to have the... Um, Capri Fun, which is the best thing that I have ever heard. Uh, it's mango pineapple lemonade. So it'll be frozen in a travel pouch with a bendy straw. We'll post some graphics on Twitter. Um, and those are going to be $10 for you to take on the go as you roll through the parades. I can attest to the uh, strength and the deliciousness of these drinks and the very difficult balance it requires in order to pull those two things off. And believe me when I stand behind this Capri Fun. All right, I'm transitioning into my final segment because I don't have time to wait for these things to download anymore. So I'm just going to pause and get into that. Hi, Dave. As I was just saying, what the hell am I saying? As I was just saying, I don't even remember. Okay, things are fine. As I said at the beginning of my episode, there's going to be plenty of time this offseason to really break down these guys. And I would feel like I was doing a disservice if I just read off their bios after really receiving all of this information. 
just yesterday. Also, to be transparent, I do have a parade to get to. Um, but that's really kind of my takeaways was just how impressed I was by the quality of the class and the quality of the conversation. And afterwards, you know, just kind of going throughout the facility and seeing those coaches and, you know, something I didn't mention, but want to break down is how they talked about that. They'll probably remain primarily three, four in nature this year, which is kind of what I was reading between the tea leaves with the hiring of both an inside linebackers coach and outside linebackers coach and a run game coordinator. Um, and him saying when talking about Justin Ibietta's recovery process, which they appreciated that he prioritized his physical and mental health before really talking about anything else. You know, people kind of are asking about whether or not might move into a different position. I know tight end really sticks out, but he, I think he said this as a joke. I almost really want to see it as an outside linebacker. And then he kind of made a plea of PSA. We still need an edge rusher. And I believe the other PSA was for tight end. If I'm correct, he made two PSAs uh, during that thing, but just kind of funny because I could totally see him being kind of that maniac type guy at outside linebacker in the same way. I really want to see Taysom Hill just take a snap or two at that position. But all of that to say, you know, there are needs that are going to be filled and the, a lot of those are on offense, but you're still, I just had a little brain blip there trying to figure it out on defense. And my longstanding point being, you know, when I caught up with Rob Green and JJ McCleskey, just their willingness to talk football on just a football level with me and talking about the three, four explaining kind of, you know, that the bandit role is probably, it, it's very similar to what we saw in the dog role. For Tulane last year, that role Devin Deal really excelled at. And then the spear role is essentially going to be anchor. Um, though, like I said, I'm curious that it's, you know, technically a three-point position. And maybe because he mentioned that they were using a lot of the same terminology, being that Sheil Wood came over from Troy to join Tulane staff. So I wonder if anchor was some kind of iteration of that, and if that really was more of a hybrid position than we realized last year. All that to say, when it's Women in Sports Day, and I'm... The only woman in the room, um, just in terms of the media that was there, I know that everyone is spread out all over the place for Super Bowl talk and what have you. But, you know, the fact that I never really feel any type of way about that at all at Tulane just speaks so much to this program. And the fact that none of that has felt like it's changed heading into this new regime where, you know, I, I still have to meet a lot of these coaches and get familiar with them. But it, it just really doesn't go unnoticed when coaches are just willing to talk football with you, talk terminology and know that you know what you're saying. And it's a very comforting feeling. And I've said a lot of the time that my confidence that I've developed over at Tulane has been so incredibly huge to how I carry myself in this industry and how I really stand behind you know my football knowledge and acknowledgement that it's still really growing and coming along. But I know what I know and what I do know, I know pretty freaking well. Um, and so all of that coming on Women in Sports Day, where I, I remember um, there was some kind of, I, I don't remember what it was, but this, I'm just going to throw that story out. There have been times where I've been places and I felt that it's been very hostile to be a woman in sports. I've talked about these things, um, you know, previous years on radio and what have you, but I always have a moral compass that makes it very difficult for me to just remove and look at it from a football level. And a lot of the time that comes in the form of advocacy, particularly standing up for women in and outside of this industry. I mean, I'm dancing around the Deshaun Watson topic, but you know, that's something that I'm not willing to just not discuss and having a legal background, feeling that I have a responsibility to break that down in the way that I did. But when I think about, you know, again, celebrating women in sports day, it, it sucks that I feel, you know, like I have to be an advocate in that way. Um, but if it makes one girl out there feel like they can come into this industry and they can stand up and talk about, you know, whatever matters. And I will forever give Tulane credit for letting me speak my mind on those topics and letting me have freedom of thought in that matter and that never affecting, you know, how they view me over at Tulane. But you know, on a more micro level, just thinking recently of the comments by Carissa Thompson, where I went on a guest podcast recently, and I, I said something to the effect of, I also think the conversation here is twofold, where we, we're almost kind of doing it to ourselves, where I think if a, a man says a dumb comment, it doesn't hold the same weight. And it's not really fair that women have to carry around this 
backpack full of boulders hanging on every single word that they say. But you no, know, the fact of the matter is it just goes to show that some ill phrased comments about making up sideline reports can snowball into this. Let's just diminish the entirety of that profession. And so I think, again, when you see some of the energy on Women in Sports Day, be a, a little bit less peppy and excited than you might expect. I think you really have to listen to women more and, and learn the why behind those things. But I, I, without getting into a soapbox, I, I feel like this was the first season where I, I really felt like I was viewed not just as a woman in this industry, but as an industry member. And maybe that's just a personal confidence thing for me. But I'll be honest, the Taylor Swift NFL entry, entry has made a huge difference in the ability to discuss this sport as a woman. I mean, I'm in group chats now with my girlfriends that we were never talking about football prior to this. And all of a sudden, they are all Chiefs fans. We are all invested. They're asking me uh, about certain coverages, what this means. And it's been so interesting, like exciting for me and feels like this has just been such a long time coming. And I don't know how else it would have came, to be honest with you. I, I think it's been really cool to watch a woman in Taylor Swift just single-handedly take over the NFL in the way that she had. It's, it's quite frankly inspiring, even though she has nothing to do with football at all. It just goes to show this might be a man's world, but we're all living in Taylor's when it comes to how dominant she is as an, a, a force to just be reckoned with. And I aspire to be just shown in brief moments on a broadcast and, and get people as bothered in just a 40 second span that we've delved into uh, about how much time she's shown on screen, where be one thing if we were in college where we've already been actually gypped of football game time based on these new clock rules and, and the commercials are absurd. I mean, if we're going to take anything up, why are we not taking it up with the commercials that they are playing in screen while a play is going on? And we're not even getting the broadcast information anymore. That to me is so much more asinine than a blip showing of Taylor Swift that doesn't actually affect your viewership in any way. Whereas that actually does the ad perspective. But what I want people to understand is I, I just, there are daughters out there. There are 10, 11 year old girls. And I was lucky to have a connection to the saints because of, of hurricane Katrina. I mean, that's not even really something that anyone should celebrate that it took a tragedy for me to get that invested in a football team at a young age. And I know there are a ton of young football fans that are women out there, but you know, being an only child, I, I was a soccer girl. I've always considered myself an athlete at heart, but you know, if not for my dad really enjoying philosophical conversations about football, if not for my mom being as rabid of a Saints fan that she was, you know, when would my interest in sports and football have really came out? And would I be chasing this dream, whatever my dream in this industry uh, is still carving out, if I hadn't been a fan from such a young age? And the NFL has just not been able to capture that magic for 10 and 11 year olds until literally Nickelodeon. That's been, I had to watch a game on there. And honestly, it's a really smart thing. Um, it, it breaks down football in the way that like a lot of the time I try to, in very basic terms, I often say I compare it to soccer, but it, it's there to explain to tweens what they're watching on screen. But Taylor has done more in 40 seconds for little girls becoming fans of this sport. And that's really special for me when I think of what I want to celebrate on Women in Sports Day. It's quite frankly, Taylor Swift, because I now have a, almost a new dream of being able to reach 10 and 11 year old girls, have them become football fans, have them have that desire to seek out coverage that fits their needs and have this finally be something that you know, it's not kind of just women in this industry that work in the industry. I know there are a ton of women fans, but getting them while they're young and, and making it this thing that they can watch with their dads and grow up together and always have these memories to look back on. Isn't that just nothing but overwhelming positives for me? But it really is just special being able to talk about something that previously really alienated my conversations and largely did leave me in a man's world when I started getting into the weeds of coverages and what have you. And, and I really feel like this has been the most inclusive it's ever felt. And, you know, for that reason, go Chiefs. I hope they win the Super Bowl and I will see y'all on Tuesday. <laughs>